everybody, and welcome to our webinar today, Are You Invested in Your Sleep? We hope that you will find the next 45 minutes or so to be worthwhile, informative, but most of all, fun. We have a very diverse group of attendees on this webinar, and we hope that each of you leave with answers to some of your most pressing questions regarding your own personal sleep habits and issues. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Liz Zylas, and I am a Senior Vice President at Rappaport Rikers Capital Management. We are an independent SEC registered investment advisor firm founded in 2005 with one goal in mind to maximize our clients' return on life through holistic financial planning and investment management, all while serving as fiduciaries and acting in their best interests. With this in mind, we have dedicated our efforts to add value to every aspect of our clients' lives while making sure they avoid the big mistakes that can negatively impact their financial future. We have used these unprecedented few months to bring pertinent content forward on the best ways to be successful in maximizing one's return on life. And what could be a better way to do that by, than by hearing from a leading expert on the best ways to invest in your sleep? But before I introduce you to my good friend, Nancy Rothstein, just a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, please submit any questions that you may have um, using the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen. And we will get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. And Nancy will be providing select resources for you in our follow-up email after the event. So there's really no need for you to take notes, which will allow you to just sit back and take it all in, but probably, but hopefully not falling asleep. So now on to the main event and the real reason you all tuned in today. Nancy H. Rothstein, AKA the Sleep Ambassador and the Director of Sleep Health at Resonia has a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, which our firm knows very well. Nancy is on a quest to help people live life fully 24 seven. As a sleep expert, Nancy inspires a new respect for sleep and its impact on all aspects of work, life and well-being. Through consulting, public speaking, media engagements and other venues, she pretend, presents strategic and practical solutions selected to empower people to make lasting shifts to optimize their sleep quality and quantity, both for the public and for the corporate world. Her new course on LinkedIn Learning, Sleep is Your Superpower, provides a wealth of tips to improve your sleep. Nancy consults and lectures to Fortune 500 corporations and other organizations, awakening leadership to the ROI, return on investment of a good night's sleep for their workforce and providing sleep education training initiatives for all employees at all levels. She also created Sleep Well, Live Well, a comprehensive self-managed four-week sleep improvement program coupled with the Drowsal app for corporations to offer to their workforce as well as for the public. Nancy is also the author of My Daddy Snores, published by Scholastic, which has sold over 400,000 copies. Quite an impressive resume. So Nancy, you have an MBA, and you used to be a successful investment manager who wrote a book about hedging interest rate risk. In fact, we worked together for many, many years. How in the world did you go from helping to manage investment risk for your clients to becoming the sleep ambassador? On our recent walk, you said, and I quote, I realized that investing in sleep is a key to living life well. And like sound, pun intended, financial investments integral to enjoying your return on life. Can you please elaborate on that for our listeners today? No, hi everybody. Thank you for joining in today. I'm happy you're here. That's not my noise, right? Okay, good. Um, so I really am. Thank you everybody for taking some of your afternoon, early evening to be here. Liz and I did work together for many years in investment management. And as much as I loved that, I had a snoring now ex-spouse, we're good friends. And one day, many years ago, I decided I took out a piece of construction paper in my daughter's kindergarten class and wrote my daddy snores. 
And it was like a segue from this that you mentioned, a treatise on hedging. <laughs> I remember that book. Address. I have that book on my uh, bookshelf at home. Yeah, I yeah. Both books. Well, I have both books on my bookshelf right. at home. So like, how do I go from this to this? Because I realize that sleep is a risk management issue. And I thought, Liz and all of you at um, Rappaport Rikers can go about doing all this investment management. But by the way, I love your tagline, which is uh, maximize your return on life webinar series. So like, there's really a lot of convergence here. But I started to say, wait a minute, the corporate world isn't doing anything about this. And this sleep thing is huge. It affects the bottom line of your own life. It affects the bottom line of companies. And I just took all my skills and morphed them into becoming the sleep ambassador. I mean, I think in the last two weeks, I've presented to nearly a thousand people, a huge group of LinkedIn my, is one of my clients and all over the world. I mean, this is not a local issue. This is not, this is an issue for people of all ages, all over. And it was bad enough before, but now it's nuts. I was just, I just was finishing an article I submitted to Chopra.com last night. Not too late. I can't, I got to practice. <laughs> I and it, it's, um, it's, it's basically about, you know, vote for sleep. And I tie sleep to all the different election issues. And it's just people don't, it's ironic. We're, we're designed to sleep. And like, that's why, you know, how many people are tuned in? 40 some odd people are tuned in because they're looking to sleep better. By the way, it is possible. It's very yeah. possible. So Nancy, why do you think of sleep as an investment? So you wrote a white paper um, and by the way, the white paper is accessible on Nancy's website, which is www.thesleepambassador.com. And again, you'll get that information after the webinar about the return on investment of a good night's sleep. Can you explain that more specifically? So one of, and, and what did I say? One of the best investments you can make is in your sleep because how you sleep directly impacts the rest of everything you do, your waking hours and all. And there, if you look at sleep as an investment of your time, and by the way, you know, I have a, I have a slide and it says, is sleep a waste of time or is time a waste without sleep? People love to say, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, guess what? In writing this article, I was doing some more research. Yes, if you don't sleep well chronically, it does impact your longevity, not to mention all the other health issues. So when you invest in your sleep, you're investing in your life. And for example, think about this. If, you, if an adult should sleep about seven to nine hours, and that's good quality sleep, it's not just laying there tossing and turning. If you think of the next 10 years of your life, about three of them should be spent sleeping. Wow. And those three directly impact the other seven. So there's your return on investment. Now from a corporate perspective, it's executive functioning it's safety in terms of what your job is, it's decision-making, it's, it's, it's judgment, and the list goes on. And talk about sleep-deprived politicians and investing in your sleep, like we're not even gonna go there. Yeah, yeah, no, not on this call. <laughs> um, so every person's body is different, obviously, but how many hours of sleep do you as the sleep guru recommend people get and sort of, a connected to that, many people rationalize less sleep during the work week, figuring they can make it up on the weekends. Does that really work or is that just a fallacy? So it isn't me as the sleep guru who's going to tell you it's research based. And I spent um, four years on the NIH's sleep disorder research advisory board. So I was, I had a lot of inroads into sleep science, which I was looking at anyway, but certainly was very engaged in that for a long time. And most sleep scientists say seven to nine hours for adults. I mean, it changes through the lifespan, but it isn't just about the quantity, you know, the quantity of your sleep. It's the quality. I'd rather see somebody get six great hours who has three kids were, you know, is a doctor working full time and six great hours than nine hours of tossing and turning. So, the, and the other thing is consistency. 
your circadian clock, your circadian rhythm, love consistency. So going to bed and getting up at about the same time every day makes your body and your brain very happy because they know what to do. But as far as, you know, I only sleep four hours a night during the week. I have a lot of Diet Coke, I have caffeine, you know, or maybe you're one of those rare short sleepers. But I make up for it on the weekend, like students, college students do. Uh, not going to happen. And the reason is we have something called sleep debt. And sleep debt is the difference between the amount of sleep you get and the amount of sleep you need. And you can no more pace chronic sleep debt and accumulation of sleep debt. And as an investment advisor, you certainly understand that. But you can't, you can't make up for that in a weekend any more than you can wake up, make up for chronic weight gain in a weekend. So that's a fallacy. Um, you know, short term, because you're, you're busy, you're traveling, something's going on, you're stressed, whatever. Of course. And, and by the way, we, in case we don't, it doesn't come up, napping. I do want to say that napping is not a substitute for nighttime sleep, but it's really important, especially now for a lot of people, if you're really tired, you're sick or you're pregnant or you have to drive, you cannot drive drowsy, get someone else to drive, don't drive. And you need a nap that's over a half an hour, a power nap, then do it. Just don't, if you're doing it regularly, ask yourself why. But the reason, by the way, you wake up groggy if you go over a half an hour is because you're in a sleep cycle. Got so, it. Yeah. All so, right. So for those of us who find ourselves working from home and napping, you're telling us that's okay. It's okay for a half an hour or less. A 20 okay. minute power nap, that's a time to set your phone. Yeah. And it definitely improves alertness, but do not get in your bed and do it. Just sit yeah. somewhere and make it short. Got it. Okay. So- some of these may be obvious, but I think you can't hear it enough. So what are the biggest culprits that prevent people from getting good sleep? And then uh, sort of the same thing, what are some primary suggestions to get more restful sleep? So what shouldn't we be doing and what should we be doing? So before I get into the lovely culprits, the biggest ones, I am going to start out saying, because this is really important that we get this, like, why are we even having this conversation? We were designed to sleep. Like, why is everybody having trouble sleeping? Because our biology hasn't changed and won't for eons. Our behaviors have changed. Thank you, Thomas Edison. Thank you, Bill Gates. Thank you, Steve Jobs. It's all great, but it has led to bringing daytime into night. And our physiology, our brain, our body can't assimilate that. So the biggest culprit, da 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 by the way, 80% of couples, it's the last thing they look at before they go to sleep. Just think if they had conversations. So this is a culprit because it is not only stimulating our brains, but the blue light that comes out of all these tech devices is telling our brain to stay awake, telling our body to stay awake, inhibiting the release of melatonin, which is not the sleep hormone. It's the hormone that regulates our light dark cycle. So I was just doing a Peloton workout this afternoon and the woman doing the workout was talking about camping and how when she goes camping, she goes to sleep when it gets dark, she wakes up when it gets light and how wonderful it is because we're, you know, that's how we evolve. So the biggest culprits are technology, but and this was like one of my favorite things I've ever said about sleep. The, because, and you, were, you asked me the question when we were practicing and discussing this, and you can ask me again, but the best sleep technology is inside of you. Think about it. It's like this incredible mechanisms inside of us to sleep. And then we screw it up. With, and it's not only the, the, the phones, it's, the, it's all the activity we engage in before bed. We're so damn stimulated. It's like eating before bed. Somebody just told me the other day, well, red wine helps me go to sleep. And I'm like, and how do you sleep? Really not so great. I wake up during the night and well, I want you to do an experiment for a week. I want you not to have red wine any like within three, four hours of bed. And then just call me in a week and let me know what's happening. And 
already two days later, she called me about some things she was changing. And it was just because it plays, alcohol plays havoc with your sleep cycles. So, so it's the technology, it's the brain stimulation, it's, it's just being too active. So what you need, because you ask, what do you do? Let's talk about technology in a minute and all the apps and your Apple Watch and all that stuff. And if that's good for your, you know, if that helps and all you learn about your sleep and all that stuff. But I think you need to look at preparing for sleep, everybody, the way you prepare to go on a trip. Oh, what's that? Wait, do, what's travel? Like, we don't do that lately, but you prepare to go on a trip. You prepare to exercise. You prepare for a meeting. You prepare to cook. You need to prepare to sleep. You need a distinct bridge from your waking to sleep. And a great way to do that is set your phone alarm an hour before you plan to go to bed. Just try this as an experiment. And that's your cue to put this away. And, and if you have emergencies or things and have a ring through kind of thing, put it on the other side of your bedroom, better yet out of the bedroom, recharge your devices out of there so you can recharge in bed. And so put this aside. Now you've got people say, oh my God, what am I gonna do for an hour if I'm not on this? Like really? Um, a book, a book. I used to, it's funny when I wrote this, it was somebody said, I said, this is good for going to bed. It'll put you yeah, to sleep. It that probably would be, would be. Right. yeah, exactly. But get yourself, not the world's best novel you can't put down, although that has been a culprit for me during this with some very good novels. Um, Get something, just a nonfiction, a magazine, don't read on your devices and see what happens. And then a major, major thing to do before bed, and if you wanna do it in the morning too, go for it, is a shower or a bath. It raises the body temperature a little bit. And for those of you who say, you know, if meditation comes up, how good it is to meditate, and you say, I can't meditate, I can't stop thinking. Here's a good thing, go in a shower, Close your eyes and feel the water running over you. Feel it on your eyes, on your face, on your body, on different parts of your body. And just have that luxury because most people don't. And just that is mindfulness. That's meditating. It's that simple. And yeah. so do that before bed. Talk to somebody in your family, talk to your, you know, your spouse, your bed partner, your children, read a book, fold the laundry, empty the dishwasher, quiet, relaxing things, stretch a little bit, but think of that hour as your you time. And it's not a time to do, it's a time to be, which is one of the things this pandemic is forcing us all to think about is being more than doing. So. Yeah, for sure. No, those are great. You know, as I said, simple. It's not brain surgery, any of this, but it's just we are all so wired in so many ways that, you know, this prepare, this idea of preparing for sleep, it's like, who has time to prepare for sleep? But obviously you need to prepare <laughs> for sleep if you want a good night's sleep. So it, yeah, and it no. isn't just the preparing, it's the transition. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you something that was fascinating to me. I was reading a, 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 an article, a psychology related article, and it said that, you know, with so much depression and anxiety going on right now between the pandemic and, and social unrest and the election and everything, it's like, ugh. and one of the things it said, and I thought that was so interesting, was one of the first times that people have any quiet and, and they are, start thinking about everything is when they lay down in bed. And I'm like, you know, that's so true. And then what ends up happening is you're just fraught with thoughts and anxiety and worries. And, you know, one, write, have a journal, have a, a notepad to write things down. But that's, a, you know, you might have prepared for sleep, but then you lay down and all your barrage of thoughts starts. And I think especially in this COVID time, I think, you know, at least I can speak for myself and I can speak for a lot of my friends and colleagues, I think that's just what they feel. Their minds, like their minds just don't stop going. And that's, you know, that's the problem. Yeah. Remember that technique I try, I shared with you? Yes. Should we do, should we do yes, that? Yes, I was, so I was going to say, so, um, you know, the re, how this webinar came about is Nancy and I um, 
took a lovely walk through Lincoln Park. Um, and it was, uh, you know, we were just, you know, catching up and she was telling me about, you know, webinars that she's done. And all of a sudden a light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, wait, maximizing your life, maximizing. Anyways, but one of the things that, and by the way, the walk was social distanced, of course, we were both wearing masks. Um, don't you feel like during this period of time, we're all like rationalizing and making like you, like, when in the past, when you went on a walk with somebody, would you like give any specifics? But of course it was social distance. Anyway, um, you mentioned that proper breathing is key to our sleep, as well as our waking hours. So A, can you share why it's so important, um, even more so these days, and give us the technique so maybe we can, you know, try our best to, um, you know, use it at least tonight and hopefully, right. you know, in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I love when people leave, you know, a presentation and look, I'm not here to hear myself speak, I'm here to empower you. Because one of my favorite things to say is only you can sleep for you. You cannot outsource your sleep. Nobody can do it for you. So I'm going to start out with sort of breathing 101 and segue into this technique when you're laying in bed and you can't fall asleep or you've got a lot on your mind or you wake up during the night. I'm going to share something that includes breathing. So there is a book, it will be on, you know, you can write it down, but it'll be on the resources, but it's called Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art. And I've gotten to know the author, James Nestor. He's a journalist, but it's a wonderful book. He's done for breathing in a way what Ariana Huffington with her book, The Sleep Re Revolution did for sleep. They're journalists, but they're bringing a lot of research and science. You should be breathing through your nose, in and out. I listened to the Peloton app today. And of course it's breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And I always wanna go back to two of my global leading experts on breathing. I don't have to anymore. They're gonna say, Nancy, you are, you know, you're trained. I'm a certified breathing, whatever. And, and you should breathe in and out through your nose. You should breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. How's that for visceral? So. <laughs> Wait, Nance, I just tried it, okay? And I tried it the other day also when we were on our walk. And I get a little dizzy. Okay. So is it take so practice? Let's, let's, just, let's just talk about this. <laughs> okay. For, we have to breathe to live. And yeah. for some people, nasal breathing isn't possible. They have a deviated septum, they have congestion, they have allergies, and they have bad habits. So you just by breath, The New Science of a Lost Art, it's an incredibly interesting book. You will never breathe or look at it the same again. Why do you breathe through your nose? You humidify, purify, and warm the air through your nose. And when you breathe through your nose, and by the way, 75% of your nasal cavity isn't this, it's inside. And when you breathe through your nose, you oxygenate properly and process CO2 when nitric oxide's produced optimally. And you oxygenate like all those branches, like in capillaries in your body, like in a tree with all its branches. So through your nose. When you breathe through your mouth, you activate your sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. When you breathe through your nose, it's your parasympathetic, your calming nervous system. Have you ever seen somebody hyperventilate through their nose? <laughs> you know, it's one thing if you're doing some kind of a yogic breathing technique, and I've been doing yoga for over 40 years, so I know some of those. But, you know, it's like, <sighs> and animals, notice when animals breathe through their mouth, when they're hot or sick. So, so you want to breathe in and out. And if you can't see an ENT and preferably one who's trained in sleep, but you'll, you'll get a lot of information from this book and you start to become aware of it. Um, there's a product, I don't have it here. If you snore at night, it's called mute, M-U-T-E snoring.com. It is a, I, a full disclosure. I consult to the company. They're headquartered in Australia. They're in virtually every Walgreens and CVS, but I've been, and I showed Liz, I've been wearing a mute under my mask mm -hmm. and it makes it so much easier to breathe. But at any rate, you wanna breathe in and out through your nose. It's calming. It's the way that your body needs to work properly. And with that in mind for a very short breathing 101, let's talk about a technique which over years of meditation and mindfulness and my breath training and yoga, all that stuff, I realized that when I gave people more to do to go to sleep, it was like 
forget it. I don't have more time. So what I try to do is help people use their time a little bit differently. So everybody, unless you're driving, I want you to just sort of picture yourself as if you're laying down in bed. Now you're going to have to breathe and your body's going to be there and your brain is probably filled with thoughts. So think about this. Your body is always in the present. It's honest. If you listen to it, it talks to you. And your body is not in the past or the future, but where's your brain most of the time? Right, Liz? You're, you're here, you're there, you're like, what happened today, what you've got to do tomorrow, and it's all over the place. So if you can use your breath to, and your body awareness to bring yourself into the present, you're not going to be all over the place. But when people say stop thinking, I mean like really. The minute you say to somebody, stop thinking, it's like... So what would you replace in your brain that would be calming and that you could utilize with your breathing and your body awareness? Ah, gratitude. Maya Angelou, the late Maya Angelou said, let prayer, let gratitude be the prayer you, let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna combine breathing, body awareness, and gratitude. How do you do that? So close your eyes and pretend you're laying in bed and breathe down to your feet. You don't have to scrunch them up or anything. Breathe into your feet and thank them. Feet, you did so much for me today. You get to rest. You don't have to do any more. Breathe up your legs. If you have a sore knee, talk to your knee, give it a little extra love. Keep breathing up your legs, thank them, let them know they can rest. Breathe into your abdomen. Thank it for all it's done, your digestive system all day. Can you thank it for being fat? For being fat or fed? Fat, fed and fat. Well, gosh, <laughs> I have a daughter who's an expert in body image stuff. So. You know, she, I know you do. She That's actually, a whole nother, a whole she, nother conversation. Yeah. She did a piece like over 3 million people on Buzzfeed called that is not a feeling. So we're not going there, but if you go to your stomach and you're thinking it's fat, love that you have a stomach because without it, you're not going to live. So say, I'm so apologize to it. Say, I'm so sorry. I'm always giving you a hard time. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you. And then breathe in. I mean, after you said that. Breathe into your heart. Like when's the last time any of us thanked our heart and say, you know what? I'm not running right now. So you can calm down and relax and thank you for breathing all night. And then breathe up into your eyes. You can open them now, but breathe into, when's the last? I mean, for those of us who can see, like talk about a blessing and a gift to be grateful for. So what happened? You have to breathe. Your body is present, your brain wasn't, but through gratitude, you connected it all. And you took, when your brain is literally in a state of gratitude, you're not going to be frustrated, you're not going to be angry, and you've given your brain something calming to do. Again, that's mindfulness, call it meditation, whatever you want. And if you're fine, you know, you keep drifting off to other stuff, just come back to gratitude. And if you say, this is bullshit, I just can't do this, then be grateful for a bed and a pillow. Because I, I just was, I'm writing another article on the democratization of sleep and plenty of people don't even have an environment, not to mention a bedroom or a bed in which to sleep. Things we take for granted. So just feel your bed and just say, oh, I can do this. I'm going, I want to use, and believe me, I have sleepless nights here and there, and there is nothing more frustrating than laying horizontal and not being able to go to sleep. And so if you're tossing and turning and you've tried everything, then just get up, turn on the light, read something peaceful, get out of bed, go fold some laundry, do a few stretches, just anything calming don't get engaged on your computer or your phone. Just, just do whatever it takes that's relaxing. And when you feel tired again, you can try to go back to sleep. And try that technique if you wake up during the night. It's really yeah. And, and you ask for tips. 
do not look at the clock. The minute you look at this or this, your brain starts counting and thinking and planning and being upset about you're not gonna function the next day because you're gonna be too tired. So it's, it's, it's actually pretty, it's a pretty simple prescription. Yeah, it really, it sounds really simple. Um, you know, I think in practice, as you said, I mean, you know, these are incredible, in my opinion, just, you know, simple tips to definitely help people sleep. But I think we all have to realize that it's not going to work all the time. And um, it's not going to work overnight. No, I mean, you don't change chronic sleep or even temporary sleep problems in a night, but keep it simple. Step yep. by step, you don't want to engage. Like I had this hour conversation with one of my daughter's friends the other day and she, and, and on the phone. And I said, you know, I'm not only telling, suggesting two things for now, because um, if I give you too much, it's just too much. Yeah. And you can't expect all these changes to, you know, ju it's just too much. Yeah. So tonight, maybe you turn off your phone a half an hour before bed, you set your alarm and that's your you time and you experiment with it. Or you try this, this trilogy of breathing, gratitude, and body awareness in bed tonight. I love the gratitude thing. I think that it's, is really, that's just a beautiful way to, yeah, I like that. Um, all right, so I don't want to cut you short, but we have about less than 15 minutes left, and we have a bunch of questions mm. from the audience, and I feel like I've covered most of what I'm um, I wanted to, and I'm guessing that people, you know, are on this call for, they have specific questions. So I'm going to, oh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go over to some of those right now. Um, okay. So, oh, first of all, there was one question earlier. Um, one of the participants um, sound went out when you were talking about napping. So can you just briefly repeat, you know, your sure. recommendation on whether to sure. nap or not to nap and the best way to nap? Oh, that's a book to nap or not to nap. Oh, look at that. I actually, I actually, I didn't write it. I no, I wrote a piece on that. It was, it was to sleep or not to sleep. It's on Chopra.com. It was um, light comfort in the darkness. And it's all about Shakespeare and Hamlet and to sleep and or not to sleep to be or not to be. So you should look at that, but to nap or not to nap. Uh, yes. If you're tired, the only, the, by the way, the only way to deal with sleepiness is to sleep, but it's napping isn't a substitute for nighttime sleep, but a power nap of like under a half an hour is great. However, if you are sick or you're, you have to drive somewhere or you're pregnant and, and exhausted or whatever, and you need a two hour nap or an hour nap, go for it. But just recognize you don't want to do that regularly because if you need that regularly, there's an issue but other than sick or pregnant. And the reason you tend to wake up groggy from long naps is you're in the middle of a sleep cycle. So just keep, and, and if you have trouble falling or staying asleep, you shouldn't be napping after about 4 p.m. for sure. Maybe a quick power nap because you're going, you know, you're doing something and you're really tired. So yes, napping's great, but it's not a substitute for sleep. Okay, terrific. Um, okay. so. You mentioned that you wear something underneath your mask to breathe, to breathe better. Can you repeat what that was? And what do you do about your glasses fogging up when you're wearing a mask? Um, so people sometimes say, why do you keep pushing that? And it's so that they're, I got some spray for my glasses that helps a little bit, but it's, it's also the way the mask fits. So you just, it is, it is a, um, it is part of the whole deal. So it's a way about the way the mask fits and all, but the thing underneath it, and I'm tempted to go run and get the box, but just go to M-U-T-E, mutesnoring.com. And you'll see on their website, I think they even have, cause they did a whole campaign. They're in Walgreens, they're at CVS, they're on Amazon. Full disclosure, I consulted the company because it's a, it's a game changer. It is not a, a cure for sleep apnea, but if you use it and it doesn't do the trick, you know you need to go further. So it's called Mute and I wear it under my mask and I cannot tell you how much it helps because it opens your nasal airway about 30 some odd percent. So it's really pretty terrific. And it's also great for snoring or if you have, God, I've watched people recently, just last week, I had someone put one in who had a deviated septum 
and they said, they said, oh my God, I can sit up straighter. I haven't breathed through that side of my nose in years. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a nasal technology and it's being used with, um, for, for all kinds of ultimately drug delivery and all kinds of interesting things. So again, your nares, your nasal cavity is so important that it's functioning properly and it's hard with the mask. By the way, Liz, I think you're probably a size small on the mute. Okay, thank you. I haven't gotten it yet, it's on my list. Well, we'll take my, a walk and I'll bring it and I'll make sure yeah, it fits. Right. Exactly, I'll look forward to that. Um, this is an interesting question. What do you think about taping your mouth shut during the night? So my ex started, there was always 3M paper tape next to his side of the bed. Like 30 some odd years ago, Stephen was taping. Like I still, I, who told you to do that? Because he would wake up with a dry mouth. If you wake up with a dry mouth, it's a sign that you're a mouth breather and possible breathing issues such as sleep apnea. And I have mild sleep apnea. Taping your mouth shut is a, it's in the book breath, you'll read about it. And so I actually tape my mouth shut sometimes. Some people, it is so claustrophobic, the thought is awful. You could put a piece here, but why? It keeps you from mouth breathing. And it's a great thing to do if you're watching TV, not in bed, not too late at night, but you're watching TV or during, tape your mouth down and see what happens. See if it helps train you to properly nasal breathe. But yes, it is, and I sometimes tape, and, and one that's good to use is 3M's Next Care. It's blue, it comes in a blister, like in a, you know, covered with plastic, and it's called Next Care uh, for Sensitive Skin. And then there's another one called Somnifix, S-O-M-N-I-F-I-X.com, and it was on Shark Tank. And it actually has a little vent, patented vent, so if you feel like claustrophobic, it's almost like a fail safe, but yet, yeah, so do some research. It's, it's pretty well covered in the book breath that I mentioned, but yes, mouth taping. So the question is, why are you doing it? Yeah. Who Whoever knew? asked the question? I kind I, I wasn't, I, I had no idea that that was even a thing, it's, but it's okay. It's next to my bed. Okay. I do wow. it periodically, but I'm, I'm, know. I'm a good nasal breather. So yeah, good to the know. question is, why are you doing it? Right. That's the deeper question. Yep. Um, okay, does putting the blue light filter on your phone help? Such a good question. And the answer to that is yes, it helps if you put you know, night shift on your Apple, on your iPhone or whatever. But here's the problem. It's not 100% effective. And two, there's still the brain stimulation. You know, you need to, you need to get away from all this technology so you can relax for sleep. And if you told me that, you know, you like to listen to podcasts in bed or watch your Netflix shows just for, for first for two days, four days, a week, just see what starts to happen when you stop all that. It, start a half an hour, then go to an hour before bed and see what happens. Yes, it helps. But, and yes, reversing the light. So you have white letters on your iPad to read and dimming the light. Yes, it helps. But you tell me, everybody, if you get a text, you ignore it? You get engaged? I mean, if you're on your phone doing whatever you're doing and you have night shift on, but you're still getting texts and looking at them, you know, what can I say? Yeah, there's nothing you can say to that. No. Yep. Okay. Um, so you kind of addressed this, but several people sort of asked this question again. So it must be very popular. And I know I... I experience this often. So I fall asleep fine. And three different people have the same question. I fall asleep fine, but I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep. You know, you did make some suggestions, but in one of the cases, um, the person asking the question says, I'm not anxious. I'm not worried about anything. I just wake up and I can't fall back asleep. So, you know, you've kind of addressed it, but maybe if you can give a couple of more specific tips. First, I'm going to say, and this isn't what you read a lot, but I often wonder, what did the person do in the hour before bed? Like, did they usurp, did they screw up their melatonin so it's not like lasting through the night? Like, were they on watching TV in bed and on their phone in bed and they fell asleep fine? But so you, 
got to really watch what you're doing in that hour or so before sleep. And the lights in your house at night should be pretty dim. You don't want a bunch of fluorescent lights all night. So that's number one starter. Number two, don't look at the clock. Whether you can fall asleep again or not, because your brain's going to be activated. And three, try that technique I, I suggested about, you know, with the, with the body awareness, the breathing and the gratitude, that's a good one to try. And if you're tossing and turning, you know, and you sort of suspect you're not going back to sleep, then do get up and read, or if you have to go in the other room, because you have a bed partner, you don't want to awaken. But is music, and someone else has the question, what about listening to relaxing music? Is that too so, stimulating? It's a, such a good question. Um, if you want to listen to music before bed, I'm going to ask, where is it? Is it on your phone or where is it? But here's the problem. People who leave their TV on all night or their phone on all night, white noise is one thing, such as the dome, D-O-H-M. Um, that's a good, like, it, but it uses the actual air. The problem with music is your brain has to process that noise. So your brain is being active when it should be doing, I mean, we don't have time to talk about the glymphatic system, but there's a wonderful TED Med talk. One more reason to get a good night's sleep. Your brain, like your lymphatic system, your brain, brain has a glymphatic system that cleanses itself. And if you regularly don't get good sleep, your brain becomes like a dirty kitchen and welcome to premature dementia and too much amyloid beta plaque on your brain. So again, you want to give your brain the opportunity to do what it needs to do during sleep, which is a lot. It's yep. not, you know, it's processing memory. It's encoding memory. It's deciding what to keep and not to keep. It's, it's rejuvenating. It's cleansing. It's flushing toxins. It's so busy. And then the music goes on. Yeah. And, or the light. So, prob from your so probably not. Okay. We have three minutes left and I want to answer. I want to try to get um, two more questions answered. Um, so a few different people asked about melatonin, you know, like the pill melatonin um, or like a Motrin PM or some other sleep aid. What is your thoughts so on that? I have an MBA after my name, not an MD. So I never prescribe anything. But my question is, why do you need melatonin? Did you know you produce it naturally? Are you inhibiting it? Are you impeding it from coming out? That's question number one. Number two, it's not really regulated. So if you're taking it, ask your doctor. And all of these sleep aids don't particularly give you more sleep, maybe melatonin if you really need it. But some of these other things and sleeping pills, they, they, and they, they detract from your dreaming. And dream health is so important. It's not just sleep. It's literally what happens to your brain when you're dreaming and REM sleep and processing um, and memories and emotions. And it's fascinating stuff. So ask yourself why you're taking these things. And, and are they, I just had this with a friend last week. It turns out they've been taking some sleep drug from a psychiatrist for years. And it turns out from a test they did, they have sleep apnea. So the medication was masking sleep apnea for over a decade. And that is not a good thing. So if you snore, if you wake up with headaches, if you're tired, if you don't drink a lot before bed, that's another thing why you may be awakening. Um, you don't have a prostate issue, but you have to pee a lot. That can be a sign of sleep apnea. So you just have to be your own sleuth. You have to pay attention. You have to ask, ask yourself, what could I actually do to improve my sleep? And for the record, all the great sleep habits in the world won't cure a sleep disorder that needs tending to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. One last question. And then I'm just going to make a very brief closing remark. Um, with the upcoming time change coming in a couple of weeks, what is the quickest way to adjust to that? You have 30 one seconds. Thing, yeah. <laughs> one thing to do is you, the, society tells us to change our clocks. So if you want to sink into it comfortably, fall back a little sooner, like 15 minutes a night for the next few, for the next week or two or whatever it is, so that you adjust to it. And it's not like this big shock to your system so that you can adapt to it. Both, you know, fall back because you're going to, you know, you're going to wake up and the clock says one thing, your body thinks it's another. So just sort of adjust that and do a little research. I've written about that, but it's a great question. 
Yeah, thank you so much. All right, I, we got to most of the questions, not all, um, but we did our best. We don't want to, you know, keep you guys um, too long. But I really just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to my really, really great friend, Nancy, for this wealth of simple yet fascinating information. And thank you so much to the audience for staying engaged for the past 45 minutes. This investment cost you 45 minutes of time no money, but we hope that the return may be of great value to you. And our one simple wish for all of you is to get a good night's sleep, tonight at least, using some of the suggestions that Nancy provided. A crucial step in the right direction of being able to maximize your own return on life. Thank you, everybody. Take care, stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>